Good morning, everybody, or afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Welcome to Comic Art Live. Uh, this panel, uh, John Suntress here from the Word Balloon Podcast. Very happy to welcome uh, my buddy. We're going to talk for an hour about his art and uh, just thoughts on uh, comics in general. It's Hillary Barta. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you, John. Good to see you again. Absolutely, man. And uh, really excited to uh, show people uh, looking over uh, your your years in comics, your years, your decades in comics. Let's age us both. But this is uh, this is great, man. Honestly, you sent me some really fun stuff, and I can't wait to talk about it. Um, God, one thing as uh, when did it occur to you that you could uh, possibly uh, do have a career in comics? Um, about I think it was Thursday. Um, <laughs> well. You know, people ask you a certain question. That's one of those questions people ask me. And I think it was in high school that I saw a few magazines, maybe like um, about European comics. And I realized, oh, it wasn't just the comics I grew up with, you know, Marvels. I was a Marvel guy when I was a kid. And, um, and then I started thinking about it. But I was kind of late to the game. You know, I know we were talking just earlier about, you know, artists that got into comics when they were teenagers. And I... I was way behind that game, but uh, yeah. So, so probably in high school, I started thinking about it, and maybe in my twenties, I realized, oh, I can do this. I go to a convention, I'm meeting people. They allowed us to sit at tables in Chicago. They this the guys that ran the Chicago, uh, you know, Comic Con were great because you, as a fan artist, you could get a table for free and sit wow. there and sell, try to sell your art or do sketches, and you know feel important, feel like you were, hey, I'm somebody. It's kind of silly, but they did it. They were great. Uh, there's really very few shows that allowed every artist in for free like that. Um, yeah. That's terrific. That really shows you how great the community was. Not that the community isn't great now, but just how simple and, and approachable it was back then. That's wonderful. I think the lines weren't as clear between, you know, fan, professional, whatever. It was a little more of a just a general fandom, right? And maybe things had to be, hadn't been codified or, you know, whatever the word would be for organizing the structure of how you break in. So for me, it was going to Chicago Con every year for quite a few years as a fan artist and, you know, doing some work for published fanzines, things that were a little more professional. And at one point, I was showing my illustrations to uh, my portfolio, which were mostly illustrations, not comics then, to Al Milgram, who happened to show up. He was a, an editor at Marvel, a guy, you know, I'm seeing his name on comics. And Al said, well, you know, maybe we could get your work as an inker because I wasn't showing him continuity. And it took a few months to get a tryout page and or two. And um, based on the quality of my work, it took me many months to get the next tryout page. <laughs> But eventually, you know, maybe in a year or so, I got my foot in the door and they started giving me a story. And, and yeah, it was all through Al Milgram. Uh, That's awesome. Now, uh, was the thing the first book that you worked on? That was the first series. Yeah, I did. I did a couple of pages uh, for the Defenders. I did an issue of the Defenders. But a regular, the regular, uh, regular ongoing inking job was the thing. Yeah. From the first issue, you know, uh, to. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. And that was uh, Ron Wilson. And I love this. You, you pointed me to a house ad that they did promoting uh, what was coming. And uh, this is uh, Marie Severin art. Yeah, you can see there are caricatures of Ron. Ron is wearing the dark blue and carrying the sledgehammer. Uh, John, <laughs> Byrne, John Byrne is up at the top with a chisel or something. I don't know what he's doing. John wrote the series. Our editor, Anna Senti, is, is swinging on the moon. And I've got like a a, a power sander or something there. <laughs> okay. like, it, I mean, the fact that Marie Severin, because I was I was already really up on a lot of comic book history, and the fact that Marie Severin did a caricature of me at the beginning of my career is kind of crazy, you know? And then I was working with John Byrne and Ron, and I really didn't know how easy and lucky I was to get in the way I did at, the, at that time. Yeah. Because I was terrible, <laughs> so I, well, I, I was nervous, and I think that affected my work. It, it, I, I got better, uh, you know, over time, but very at the very beginning, pretty stiff, pretty uncertain, you know. 
the usual kind of problems. Well, I'll tell you, man, you, you, again, uh, we mentioned the defenders. You sent me this great splash splash page of uh, Dodd Perlin uh, pencils and your inks. looks pretty good to me, man. I don't know how far into. Well, that's the first issue that I got to ink. And in fact, I really kind of went crazy on it, adding the lighting effects where I could, as though Don Perlin's pencils were all there. And I re it was really great inking Perlin because Perlin really felt like an old fashioned comic artist. To some extent, Ron Wilson did too. Um, you know, they both kind of harken back to the 60s uh, Marvel. And in this case, though, I, I, I'm going to tell you a story because this ties in with going to the conventions. <laughs> that, that, that page. Uh, I had done the work and, and I went to the next year's show. Now here, now I'm a published Marvel inker. I was really excited and proud. And Jim Shooter was at the show. And for some reason, even though my foot was already in the door at Marvel, I came up to show my inking, my Marvel inking to the head, the editor in chief, Jim Shooter. And Jim Shooter was sitting there at his table with a bunch of people around. And he took the page from me and turned it upside down said to everybody, see this? This is wallpaper. And I immediately kind of like, you know, shriveled up into a, you know, <laughs> about, about, you know, I, I, I just, it was, the, it was really a shocking thing for him to say. And, and he went on to explain what he didn't like about it uh, was that it was the same kind of lighting was all the way through from the foreground into the background. There was light and dark. There was nothing to separate the planes of foreground, middle ground. Uh, but it was a very harsh kind of hello, how do you do kind of thing. Sure. Jesus. Had, I known, had I known Shooter's reputation for being a tough guy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have shown him my work. That's <laughs> anyway. hilarious. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I didn't realize, too, and again, we've got examples, that uh, you, you were an artist on Power Pack. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's a little later on. I mean, this is some years later after I'd done work at uh, other inking work at Marvel, gone on to first comics. When I came back to Marvel, I that was probably I probably did more work on Power Pack than any comics. I really liked inking John Bogdanov. That's a that's a case of John's pencils there. He was okay. fantastic. I mean, John still is a great artist, but his treatment of those children very sensitive. You know, really. It's got cartooniness to it, expressiveness, and yet he could do action as well. Um, yeah, you can see just how lovingly detailed and animated the children are. It is really a wonderful strip. Great faces, absolutely, man. Um, here, I got another. Yeah, that's so a, that, a, yeah, that's a cover. Hard to make it out. Yeah, it's hard to make it out at that size. But um, the, the power pack themselves are in the background. In the foreground, a girl is falling backwards off the bridge. Her parents kind of you know trying to stop her sure very cool man that's excellent um and then also during this time and I, i'm gonna have to scroll down to grab it here it is you did these strips for uh, joystick magazine well, that was pretty early on that's 1983 that was a local magazine uh that was all about gaming and so you know <laughs> I, I i talked my way into doing some strips with gags about gaming yeah that's great, and it's kind of a precursor to some of the stuff you're doing now. I want to point everybody to your gallery that is up at uh, Comic Art Fans, and uh, people should go to that. And uh, I'll I'll put up the URL. I uh, I haven't uh, I got to grab it, but uh, you know, yeah, you you look at you look at these, and then you look at uh, you know what you do on uh, on Screwy Tuesdays as a regular thing, and there's 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 the through line. So this is some modern stuff that you've been doing lately. And yeah, tell me about Screwy Tuesday. Well, Screwy Tuesday is just something I started for fun during the pandemic. Um, I'm like, well, other people are doing, you know, there's other events like um, uh, Flashback Fridays and Throwback Thursdays and, oh, even Inktober. And I just was like, oh, I want, I want to have one that's more for silly, cartoony stuff, for wacky, whatever. And I tried a different name. We tried, I kept looking for a uh, hashtag that wasn't used yet. And I think Screwy Tuesday, there might have been two. But whereas Wacky Wednesday, there were too many. So um, <laughs> so we ended up with, we ended up with Screwy Tuesday. And, uh, you know, just every Tuesday, I post a drawing with that hashtag on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and wherever. And, and you know, other people join in. And it's been kind of fun. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a community there. I'd love to have more people do it. But it's been great. And this is also, this is the art that I'm doing now that I've been, you know, 
selling on the internet on my website um, uh, on on comic art fans now. Yeah, that's got like Big Daddy Roth kind of. Absolutely, know. man. Yes, and I love that stuff. Good lord, we you know we're not we're not that far apart in age, and uh, it was these kind of the hot rods with the crazy monsters driving them, or in this case, chasing oh, them. Good yeah, stuff, I mean you man. have. I mean Ed Roth. Wallace Wood, Basil Wolverton, all those guys doing this kind of monster art in the 1960s, that so-called ugly stuff, you know, um, with, you know, Plot, Plot Magazine had that ugly art on the covers later. It just, I love that stuff. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I love the crazy EC kind of alien through line that goes all the way into that 60s stuff. Yeah. This stuff yeah, is man. all... This could be to me. These are like, I mean, they're they're vertical, not or uh, they're horizontal, not vertical, but they're very much EC horror, science fiction cover inspired kind of images. You know, this could be yeah. Mars Attack. Yeah. Well, oh hell, hundred percent, man. My God, so many of these like this. Yeah, I love this. I mean, and truly, uh, I hope you're thinking about doing uh, kind of a Mars Attacks sci-fi adventure thing because clearly, uh, it just. It's limitless. I mean, literally every Screw Tuesday, you've got something crazy that you're showing yeah. us. Well, so, I've, I've got it. I've definitely got a comic series in mind that will have aliens and, you know, the flying saucer type stuff set in that era. I, I definitely have that thing. And that's something I just got to get to take it off the back burner and put it up front. Doug Rice and I, my writing partner, Doug Rice and I, did a, uh, a, a, a uh, Mars Attacks meets Garbage Pal Kids story. <laughs> for uh, IDW, which is basically two card sets, you know, meeting. And, of course, you can imagine who's going to fight. The Mars, you know, the Mars attacks just completely destroy the garbage belt kids. But, say the kids don't have a chance, absolutely. <laughs> no, you know, they're, they're, they're basically all wearing red shirts on Star Trek. You know, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're all being blasted by death rays and, you know, melted. Into, I did I did the, the classic scene from Mars attacks cards with the with the poodle getting zapped. I, I did it, but I posed my neighbor's dog. They've got a puggle upstairs that often comes and stays in my place. Anyway, I put Banjo, their dog, in one of the scenes, and he gets zapped down into a puddle. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think that, of the movie? What do you, you know, think of the Tim Burton movie? movie? I have never seen it. I know that's weird. Really? I, I, I just didn't get out to the theaters. I've seen scenes. I've seen clips. Yeah. It's but crazy. I, it's, it's appropriately, it yeah. It's appropriately crazy, and from an animation standpoint, they got a, they got a good look for the Martians and stuff. It's hit and miss, but I do think it's interesting and a great companion. I mean, nothing can compare to the original cards, obviously. But I'm glad that you know. I think it's it's a great uh, IP, and I hate to talk in terms like that, but it's a great thing to have fun with. And and you know, you and you and Doug obviously had a great time doing that. Oh, um, I you know. Yeah. No, I, I and I like Tim Burton. I just I must admit Ed Ed Wood's my favorite movie and I've never quite warmed to his films as much after that. But um yeah, you know, I, I should see it someday. I definitely should see it. Yeah. It's yeah. it's on my list. It's on my list of things to do. I understand. I when did uh when did Plastic Man how how far between you know after Marvel did uh, Plastic Man come? Uh well after first con Comics. Uh, I went from my first comics. Oh, that's where right. I, you know, started out as an inker at Marvel. Uh, went. To, they were opening a, you know, a comic company here in Chicago, and I did work for them. And then when I went back to to Marvel and or DC, I was doing what the, at Marvel and Plastic Man at DC. Now I've come back, and I'm not just an inker, but I'm also penciling and sometimes writing. In the case of what that was writing, Plastic oh, that's Man. that's great. Plastic Man was a was scripted by Phil Folio, but Doug Rice that I mentioned I mentioned previously, um, Doug, Phil, and I kind of came up with the stories together and plotted the book. So I was I'm just I'm sort of burnt out on inking and wanted to do more of my own stuff, and my own stuff tends more towards the humor side of things. And Plastic Man is my favorite superhero. So yeah, yeah. no, I, was I, this was my first awareness of you as a reader was the Plastic Man series. So that was that was my the first things I was buying that you were doing. So that's great. But yeah, you mentioned what the and I mean, we've got a couple great images from what the to show. So uh, here's here's issue seventeen. Outstanding. Yeah, and that's 
<laughs> there's the influence from from Mad, you know, Kirchman and Wood and all those guys. I never, I never quite fit into superheroes as a as a writer, you know, because to me, I read the parodies uh, of Superman. I read Super Duper Man and Bad Boy and Reuben. And there's yeah, there's Wolverine. It's pretty hard to go back to doing, you know. The, the 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 parody subject after you've really just ridiculed the thing, but I love doing the parody. And in the case of what that was great because I got to take on Wolverine and the Punisher. And I called him the Pulverizer and uh, Wolverine. <laughs> Wolverine, uh, I, you know, because those characters were a new level of violent. You know, uh, they killed people, unlike the heroes that I grew up with. And I didn't, I wasn't really comfortable with the comic books, you know, I wasn't, didn't really want to endorse that stuff. And so when what that came along, I said, Carl, I would really love to do a parody of the Punisher. And it started in the very first issue of what the, uh, Carl was like, yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead. So I did. How I long were you, yeah. How long were you there for what the, uh, you know, we, I mean, I was, we, we, you know, I was in whatever issue, anytime I had a story done, we'd run it. But Doug and I wrote some of them together. I wrote, Wrote them with Peter Gillis. Uh, I don't know if Stephen Sullivan wrote any of those with me, but um, I, it's a number of stories. I might have done four different Punisher parodies, and you know Wolverine in a few. Um, <laughs> Doug and I wrote a parody of what was that Barry Smith um, Weapon X uh, thing? We wrote one that Joe Staten drew. So sometimes I was even just writing during that time, which, okay. which was, you know. I never really quite got beyond the writing the humor stuff, uh, you know, and, and writing more dramatic or action stuff, but I did write humor then. Yeah. When I think yeah. of, uh, and look at, um, some of the, not only the, the screwy Tuesday stuff, but really all the, what the stuff and everything, were you, uh, were you a, uh, not brand deck and plop reader back in the day when those were coming out? Oh, sure. I mean, not brand deck. Is, was a little early, but I, I have both books. Um, I don't remember if I bought them as back issues or my older brother's bought them. Uh, my first Marvels that I remember having, I think, were secondhand from my older sibling. So, you know, I had a, a Thor. When the, when they were those 25-cent issues, they were giant issues, you know, or the annuals. I had a yep. fantastic annual, a Thor. I had I have only panels left from an early, that first run of six issues of the Hulk. I clip of the Hulk transforming, you know, Banner transforming into the Hulk. I had it up on my bulletin board for years, you know, um, cut right out of the comic because I didn't know. You know right. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I, I took scissors yeah. to many a uh, uh, silver and bronze age comic over the years when I was a little kid. Definitely, man. Who to knows? This day, every comic book I own is a reading copy because to me, there's no other reason to own a comic book. But in any case, uh, yes, I love the parody stuff. I, but, but really where I got into it was the main influence was reading the mad stuff. And I got it through the, um, the paperback reprints they were doing uh, back when I was, yeah, this would be like late 60s maybe, I think, or early 70s. Whatever. Yeah, 60s, 70s, yes, definitely. Yeah. That Valentine that came out with all the – what they did is they took the early color books, the ones that Kurtzman wrote and – and, and were printed as comic books before the magazine. And they printed them in black and white art, but, but all the, you know, the panels weren't in the same, you know, page format, but they put them into these paperback books. So I read all the early parodies drawn by Wood and Severin and Elder and all the guys. I read that stuff when I was a kid and it just killed me. It's, it was so brilliant. And, you know, it's a great cultural critique too, because Mad basically pointed at every institution it tackled and said, look, the emperor has no clothes. Advertising is a lie. You know, these action heroes are all stupid and this is why. And it, it really made a, an impression on me. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And especially uh, going back to those early, especially the fifties issues, man in the fifties was like the daily show in magazine format. Like you said, in terms of being, uh, incredibly sharp parodies and and wonderful artists, great writers as well. And God, you as you know, Ernie Kovacs was contributing to Mad Magazine. I mean, the comedians of the day were also like the sick that sick movement 
was part of the mad movement and everything. So it was amazing to see those guest columns and, and uh, stories. Dave Berg, Dave Berg's, you know, God, that just unbelievable stuff right up there with elder. I think as far as great stories and everything, great, interesting ideas. Uh, well, sure. I, I did not. I mean, I, I, I never really followed. I mean, there's God, I have, I have a, a few boxes of Mads, the early ones. <laughs> I don't think Wally Wood ever did any work more astonishing than the the do a shade work he did for the black and white magazine. It's just you can just crawl into it. The space is so deep and so 3D. It's just it's just mind boggling. But every artist was upping their game for that magazine. You know, everybody knew the bar, how high the bar was. Just like EC had kind of set a bar for illustration and art. You know, Mad Mad continued that, but uh, you know, if without Mad, you wouldn't have had National Lampoon, Saturday Night Live. A lot of the stuff that we sort of accept now, the sort of parody and sketch comedy, you know, the same sort of thing that was happening in Chicago um, on stage at Second City was happening in comic books. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. No, and that and truly, and Mad was leading, and and also, God, those paperback adaptations, not only Mad. But all the comic strips they would do, the peanuts were collected that way. Beetle Bailey oh. was collected that way. Everything. I, DC. I, a, I still have a stack of peanuts collections. That's how we read the early, you know, I read peanuts that was coming out at the time in the 60s, yeah. but I read the 50s peanuts in paperback form. Yep. Yeah. No, that was fantastic. And again, it was this affordable way of getting great comics and stuff from, from you know, a few years past. Unbelievable stuff. Now, I, I always love the uh, and then they did it with the superheroes too. They did it. They did it with a lot of uh, 50s and 60s uh, comics over the years. Pretty cool, man. Yeah. I, I was a big fan. Well, back, back, and back then, if you were buying when comics, when they started playing around with the price of comics that were like you know 10 or 12 cents for many, well, they were t they were a dime forever and they just kept cutting down the page count. Then they went up to 12 cents, then 15. And then when they made the jump to 25, they, they increased the page count. And they started putting reprints in the back of those books. DC did it, Marvel did it. And I would suddenly see, you know, you could now see or read Golden Age, you know, Plast uh, Plastic Man by Jack Cole or, yeah. you know, something done by somebody else that you'd only heard of. And, you know, Plastic Man very quickly became my favorite, favorite, favorite comic, my favorite character, because Jack Cole was just such a genius, you know. Absolutely. And, and I always love that uh, Hefner had such a great respect for Jack Cole and all the and all the EC guys and, you know, certainly Kurtzman. I mean, uh, really, you know, not only he wanted to be a cartoonist, yet another failed cartoonist, uh, you know, that did well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Exactly. Very interesting, but, uh, too. Yeah. So. That's why there's cartoons in Playboy. He loved he loved cartoons. He loved comics. No, absolutely, and and again, I love just the um, the 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 sick movement. I, I was just listening to um, either Gilbert Gottfried or Dana Gould's uh, podcast, and he had uh, Wayne Fetterman on. And Wayne Fetterman just wrote a history of stand up, and they were talking in, pr in particular about that period in the fifties, and really when comedy shifted from "Take My Wife, Please" to Mort Saul coming on stage, you know, with the newspaper under his arm and ranking on Eisenhower and stuff and Lenny Bruce. And, you know, they, they planted the seeds of the next generation and everything. Well, when we were talking about the influence of Matt, I don't really see Zap and the undergrounds without EC in particular, but Matt specifically, because, you know, I mean, God, um, you know, Captain Pissgums, you know, of S. Clay Wilson was just redrawing piracy <laughs> issues. But then, he, you know, they just kept getting filthier and filthier as he got older. And, <laughs> and, and, and you know, I think the influence of Kurtzman on Crumb, uh, Crumb has spoken about it. Uh, it, it was a huge influence. So, uh, yeah, you know, this, yeah. The, man, the idea that you would sort of poke, you know, just, you know, just poke your eye in the mainstream, poke your eye in whatever, middle-class values, things that we take for granted, sacred cows, whatever it is, that idea that, you know, that's a, that's punk, right? That's everything. Yes, really absolutely, wasn't. man. I don't know what the cultural touchstone, the equivalent would be before MAD in the 1950s. I'm not sure 
I'm sure there was something in the 30s and 40s, but I don't know what it was. Yet. Well, you know, I mean, you could look at what Al Cap was doing in Little Abner, and certainly there was there was parody in in uh, Little Abner. I mean, to oh, a yeah. degree, you know, and yeah. and and so you know, and well, and also oh, yeah. I suppose did a lot of satire. And, you know, did you say Pogo? Oh, yeah, time. that's what I was going to say. Walt Kelly. Yeah, but I mean, you know, in terms of like a cultural movement, I don't feel like it has been there quite yet. But the 50s was a huge time for change. The, it's when it's when the world discovered teenagers as a market. You know, they started doing teen, you know, teen movies to you know, the rebellion thing. That you know, sure. that's, that's that's never really stopped, right? Uh, but it did kind of like you said. It started in that post-war period, especially in the fifties, yeah. where yeah, all of a sudden, you know, uh, teenagers had a disposable income, and, and manufacturers are like, wait a minute, we could make stuff for these people. Yeah, yeah, right, well, right, yeah. Pretty cool, man. Absolutely. I got you know, um there's a that David Halberstam book, the fifties, and they uh they adapted it for the history channel in the nineties. And the great documentarian Alex Gibney did a, a you know, did the it was a mini series. And it's I've seen it on YouTube and it's so great. And I urge people to watch it because you really do get a sense of where all this started. And I, you know, in a lot of ways, kind of the nerd culture started in the in the fifties. So well, you have to assume that part part of that is a reaction to because a lot of times when we think of the fifties, people say, "Oh, the Eisenhower era, conventional, the, the nuclear family, and all of that." Like, leave it to Beaver. Well, to every action, there's a reaction, you know. And you know, I think, well, you know, it's a natural process. You know, kids rebel against their parents, and it's just it, it's the order of things. Uh, of course. But, but when you set into a you know a period of supposed contentment and conservant you know conservatism, I think naturally they're going to be people that are going to be pushing against it. I'm anyway, with you, I, don't, you don't mean to get too philosophical here. We're talking about comics. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Well, now I've got a beard I can uh, uh, struggle along with uh, with your beard. We can we can pontificate oh, okay. now. Yeah, let's here we go. Okay, let's do that. Here we go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also uh, love the fact. Tell me about um, Paradox Press and the big books, and yeah. and and the stuff you were doing then. And this was this was uh, mid nineties, uh, late nineties. You know what? Don't quote me on that. But it was after most of the stuff we've talked about here. Um, Andy Helfer was the editor of this imprint, uh, Paradox Press, part of DC, and they they. These big books were their idea was there was a different format, it was larger than comic books, it was black and white, and you you um, were given scripts and the the art boards were already blue lined with panels, right? And you only and, and th there were rules and what the, the idea for this was that they wanted really simple storytelling, you know, rectangular or square panels only, and so there's there's one of my stories. That's that's half of a page. That's the top half of a page. Wow. Um, uh, Fatty Arbuckle. So you know you can see right here. Either you had a tier of three panels, or you had a choice of of making one of those three panels into two. Those were your options. <laughs> and it was a very rigid format. But their idea is they wanted this to be reader friendly to people that didn't grow up reading comics in the modern era. And it was it was comics and for people who didn't read comics, because uh, a lot of Marvel, a lot of the things that are going on in, in comics, a lot of things that we take for granted, the fact that panel borders could be like diagonal, inset panels, all kinds of crazy action, um, is 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 sometimes confusing to new readers or to non comic book trained readers. So, sure. so this was an attempt to tell stories. They called them factoid books, I think, and it was just a most of the stories, if not all, dealt with either history or fables or, you know, um, urban myths. Yes. And, and you know, in the case of that one, it, it might have been the big book of scandal, but Betty Ar Arbuckle was involved in this crazy scandal where he was accused of rape and um, probably falsely accused of rape by some con artists. But, it, you know, it, it, it temp yeah, there, and he, rape with a, with a bottle made by a man. I don't know if you can see there. But I, I asked Andy, I said, have you cleared this with the, uh, you know, with the legal department? Because it was, the trial was infamous for that he was supposedly used a Coke bottle. Yes. Um, and 
so I drew the you know the Coke bottle of that era with all the ridges, and sure. I, I I know enough to ask my editor first, can I really put the Coke logo in here? And they said yes, legal legal, because it was an actual historical thing that happened, and it was in newspapers. They said okay, and then they whited it out anyway. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, like, I, I was surprised it got as far as it did, but yeah, I didn't really believe it. But I, what are you going to do? Well, I like. I mean, the the format. Honestly, it it looks very Sunday uh, comic strip uh, in that in that Sunday paper way of like Ripley's, believe it or not. And obviously, that fit the uh, you know the aesthetic of of these urban legend kind of stories that the big books were known for. I love the big books, and I I don't know if uh, DC public you know if there if there are recent enough versions. But if you you know if you don't know of those. Scour the used bookstores and everything because truly there are so many great stories in there. And I know you contributed a lot of them and they were, they were a lot of fun. I did a handful of them. I mean, one of the fun things is just how different they were than the average story I got to draw because I, I did, it required historical research. So, you know, there you go. I'm looking up, I'm looking up old movie stuff on the life of uh, Fatty Arbuckle. I'm looking up, you know, stuff from the, you know, reference from the 1920s. And I tried to draw in, at least a, a style reminiscent of illustrations from the 20s. So I was thinking of Franklin Booth and different illustrators with their line work. And I did it all with pen, whereas I had been inking at that point in brush. I went back to pen to try to do the fine line work. Absolutely. I'll remind people that if you're popping in, because I see the numbers fluctuating, uh, this is uh, the URL for Hillary's uh, gallery at uh, Comic Art Fans. And uh, you should uh, go check that out. Um, Hillary has some of his Screwy Tuesday uh, illustrations there, and I'm going to bring a few of those back up. And then uh, do you have any uh, original pages up there as well, Hill? I, I just recently put up a few comic pages. There are pages that I inked uh, from The Shadow. Um, and there oh, wow. are pages, also pages, a couple pages from Power Pack. And I'm going to put more up. I, I, you know, this is just, I'm just starting to sell some of these old pages. I don't have too many left, but... Um, what I have, I will be putting up there. Yeah, that's that's more Scurry Tuesday. Actually, yeah. I do that. I do that one. I, I think I put it on a Scurry Tuesday, uh, but I drew it for a possible cover. A guy is doing Planet comics. I don't know if you remember. Planet was a comic that started back in either the late '30s or early '40s, but it was a pulp influenced comic, and there was always there were always like scantily clad space girls, you know, menaced by giant monsters and aliens and things. And so this was. Someone is now doing Planet. Planet must be in the public domain. And so there's this guy. He, we were talking, and and he asked if he could use one of my drawings as a cover. But I drew that one specifically for it. But he picked a different drawing instead. Oh, okay. I, I yeah, that, that could have been a Planet Comics cover, probably. Totally. So that, that's that's a little more EC-ish, probably. That's a little more like a Wally Wood alien. There. So is he is he taking the old stories and republishing them? Or is he doing new stuff and using the Planet Comic name? They're, they're new stuff. I think there is a reprint in one issue, but this is the issue he sent me. So you can see um, the old logo with the, with the rivets in it from the 1940s. Oh, yeah. And there's always it has to be a woman, you know, and some kind of monster. Stuff. I think this might be the cover that was too close to the one I, I just showed or that you were just showing. Anyway, yeah. but it's, it's, it, it's fun. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I like getting involved with, the slightly retro... Um, you know, monster, sci-fi, noir, whatever. I, I just, I do have a soft spot for that stuff. I think absolutely, the soft spot man. Right over well, here, that, this is where the soft spot is. you know, yeah, <laughs> and I, and again, that's this is your sweet spot of of just coming up with these original ideas, uh, as far as monsters and stuff. I mean, it's these are great. These are fantastic. I enjoy them. Thank you, Thank you man. No yeah, question. That's an, right here. that's an easy. That's an easy science fiction cover. You know. Sure. Invasion of the bug-eyed beasties, yeah. <laughs> Bird Eye Gordon film waiting to happen, basically. That, that, in fact, might be Two Fisted Tales meets Weird Science. I'm not sure. I like that. I like yeah, I like the Army thought behind that. And, yeah, Army guys and the U. So. There you go. And one, there, of the, one of our uh, people loves Planet Comics. That's wonderful to hear. Very cool. Very cool. Very. You know, good stuff, man. Definitely. Very, very Thank cool. You, Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad that yeah, I'm glad people are uh, are enjoying the uh, the uh, the images that we're showing, and then again, uh, pointing people to the gallery, 
that uh, Hillary's got up there and stuff. So let's uh, let's continue. So we have what the in the '90s, and we had uh, the the Paradox Press stuff with uh, the big book, uh, you know, things that you were doing. But then uh, also, uh, God, you know, that period. I guess did it start in the 2000s, America's Best Comics, or did it start in the very late '90s when you and Alan Moore were uh, doing uh, Splash Brannigan? Yes, John. I can't. It's very hard for me to answer chronology specific questions because I, I don't remember. Buddy. I don't. But yeah, that's the ballpark right around then. Uh, and that was that was a great gig. I mean, I just you know very much a mad influenced superhero book. So very similar to in that sense to Plastic Man, uh, you know, a humorous superhero. And um, we, there were, and, and even in the scripts, the Alan Moore scripts, just tossed in references to Matt. There were certain characters, you know, he's pulling on this very specific story. It's like, Hillary, you know that story? You know the wash woman that's in the story with the Sherlock Holmes parody? And, you know, I'm like, sure, well, I'll make her the, I'll make, um, I'll put her as the janitor. Or she's cleaning up with a broom in the background of a scene, you know. There were, there were a number of characters like that where just a mad story. Yeah. I'm looking for more. Here's here a here's a splash cover. Fantastic number seven for America's Best Comics. Um, yeah. so, so he's, he's fighting the needed eraser, eraser as some sort of like you know, art the artist in his garret with a giant ink pen, and then Correcto. He's the guy who's got a, a whiteout gun. Yeah, <laughs> which obviously is like Splash's kryptonite. I would think you know exactly. Yeah, though I well, that was just for the cover. Those characters don't actually appear on slide. Oh, that's too bad. Well, so tell me about the creation of uh, of Splash Brand Bran again. Like, did Alan come to you with the idea, or like, how did how did you guys get together for this? Okay, well, it's all due to Scott Dunbeer, who was the editor of he was the editor of the entire line of the ABC line of that Alan did. And um, he, I get a I get a call the way it worked at my end. I get a call from Scott Dunbeer, who I'm old friends with, and he's like, Hillary. Um, I, I I got a project you, you you might be interested in, you know, and he's like, he's just toying with me, you know, he's like, you know, it's this thing that Alan Moore's writing, you know, I'm like, would you want to do it? And I'm like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I think, I think what, I think that Alan had the idea, right. He had, a, he had, he wanted to do certain strips and some were uh, more serious, like gray shirt. This is, this is in tom tomorrow stories was the anthology book of ABC. Right. So this was, the story that had a rotating, maybe they had four or five features that rotated three different strips each issue. So we were out every third or fourth issue, whatever. I forget how many characters. And uh, so Alan had the idea. Scott suggested me. Alan approved it. So I get a call. from. I said, yeah, I want to do it. And then I get a call from Alan. And he just calls me up to tell me about his idea for the character. And which was kind of great because the script had not been written yet. It was just a concept. And I essentially, I don't know, people always, people always want to know what the Alan Moore scripts look like because they're famously, you know, verbose is not the word, detailed. You know, they're just, he just, it's like stream of consciousness. He just starts talking about the scene that you're in in the first page and, and he just drifts into the story. And all, every script I got started with "Hello, Hillary." It's always H U L L O. Hello, I, I do a British accent, but I butcher it. And I thought what we do this time is, and then he'd go off into this story. But um, Alan just had the idea, and his initial uh, concept was he wanted this inky character, a la Crazy Cat from the old cartoons from the the twenties, where he could just draw a circle on the wall and make a window out of it and then dive through it to escape whatever was chasing him, that kind of idea. And his idea was there was this cartoon character that had a magical rapidograph of ink. Okay. And he wore it like a, like, like flash Gordon had a, had a ray gun holster. And I thought about it, but, but, but this character was made out of ink. Okay. He was, a, and, and he's living ink and he has the rapidograph. I said, you know, Alan, I don't think we need the rapidograph. The guy is a human repetograph. He's the ink. I said, let me let me let me design a character and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So that I designed this character that's just solid black. And for the purposes of trademark, I put like you know the S logo on his chest, even though there doesn't need to be one. Um, but I tried to incorporate as many ink themed uh, elements into the character. So the spit curl ends in a drop. 
his his toes are, he doesn't have toes his his but where his toes would be and like little brushes you can't see in that image um and I, and, and, the, and the s is the s on his chest is a series of droplets um I, that's as clever as i can get in design I'm like can, yeah you, yeah, so it's like four droplets, two big ones in the middle and then two small ones. And <laughs> the scripts were just so much fun. And, you know, Alan it was totally cool with my idea. He said, that's great. And then he ran with it and, you know, um, and, and gave me the first script and we were off and running. Yeah, that, that was What's really it, long. Has, has Splash uh, by itself ever been collected by DC or Wildstorm? No, no, I think they might have done a Tomorrow Stories collection, uh, though I can't, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Um, you know, I know there's a, um, the artist edition, Scott Dunbeer at IDW did an artist edition of Tomorrow Stories, and he put a couple of my stories in that. That's but, great. Uh, I don't know, no, there was never a Splash Brannigan volume. And, you okay. know, to be honest, DC never collected my plastic man either, so there's a whole lot of Hillary Barter stuff that you have to go scrounge around. Old comic book, uh, Storage for you know. Oh man, I, I certainly boy. We got a we got a petition uh, DC to put that stuff back out. I, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the art uh, regarding the well, you know, honestly, they've been uh, they really have been putting out a lot of um, late seventies, early eighties stuff. Uh, they've been collecting things lately, so I would hope so. I mean that that would be really cool to see. And then also, I was going to say um, regarding the artist edition, I've never talked to an artist. Whose work has appeared in one of those gigantic, you know, IDW things? Have you got it handy? Oh no, you're drinking. You're drinking water. Oh, that's funny. We we have. have actually, no, no, no. Yeah, I was gonna say you don't have to. Eat. Well, if you got it handy, that's great. It's it's, it's still in the box actually because I got two oh, of them, <laughs> and I opened up one of the boxes, but it's not here. So the other one, no I have problem. Here. Don't open the box. It's all right, man. I was gonna get beautiful. It's beautiful. The only. The only problem for me is I'm in I'm in the book right after Art Adams, so it's like oh my god, you know, there's giant there's page after page of is it Johnny Future? I'm trying to remember his Johnny B Quick or or Jack B Quick? I no, think. Jack B no? Quick is Kevin No. Oh no, Kevin. it is Kevin. Excuse me. Yes, you're right. And, and Jack B Quick is also in there, but Johnny Future, like J O double N I Future, I think is Art Adams' character, and if I'm okay. wrong, I. But it's a beautiful strip. I just, yeah, right there. Kevin Nolan, Art Adams, and then there's my goofy cartoony next to it. Shut those. up. It's, Come it's, on. No, it's a, there's really a lot of great art in there. I mean, Scott, as an editor, was he was an art um, dealer before he was an editor. He yeah. really does have an eye for hiring the right guy for the job. Well, that's the thing, man. And exactly. I mean, really, and you're right, shame on me for misnaming uh, Nolan stuff. Uh, as uh, as Art Adams, but no, that's that was the great thing about tomorrow's comics in particular. There's the box. This nice. is how big. This is how big. Oh, I know. Are. Oh, I'm aware, so, man. Because because they're they're the artist editions are these facsimile. They're trying to create as, as close to owning the original artwork. It, it, so these are 11 by 17 boards. Um, it's it's just it's huge. It's heavy. It's yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't open it yet. So no, it's all good. I. Uh, I, I uh, hung out in uh, when I was in Portland. I was staying at Brian Bendis's house, and in his office, he's got a ton of the artist editions. And yeah. uh, he's like, "Hey, do you mind if I work for a while?" I'm like, "Hey, do you mind if I grab a chair and just start reading your artist editions?" He's like, "Do whatever you want." And it was great. And oh my god, it! I mean, they are they're they're like treasury editions. Well, they're full page size. I mean, you know, and that's that's terrific. Yeah, were you were you pleased with the one that you cracked open with? How your work looked in the, uh, no, in the book? No, no, I'm, I'm more than pleased. It's it's crazy. Yeah, I got to one of the goofy things was is Scott just said, "Look, Hillary," because I had every single page from my uh, the Splash brand again, except for one splash that I sold to a, a collector. And when I really needed the money, I had it in San Diego, and the guy said, "I said, he said, well, but if you were selling it, how much would you?" And it was that kind of thing. Uh. I sold one page, but then I also sold an entire story to my editor, Scott Dunbar, because he wanted to give a story to a friend of his as a, as a wedding gift. So he, every other page I had, I sent the entire collection of art to IDW, and then Scott poured over it and figured out which story he wanted to use, uh, which stories he wanted to use. Well, he then returned the artwork to Chicago. The one other artist that's in there in the same edition 
is um, Alan Weiss. Alan Weiss did a different different uh, character. He did he did he did some Tom, uh, Tom Strong. I think he did may have done Young Tom Strong. Um, okay. But he, but he's in a different artist edition. But it's you know one of the uh, one of one of the um, Alan Moore artist editions. In any case, the art was shipped. Whoever was shipping it sent Alan's art to me and my art to Alan. <laughs> so this box came in and I was kind of looking at it, you know, and I knew it was from IDW. I assumed it was a Splash Brannigan art, but I'm thinking, it's not as big as the box I sent to them, you know, and I was wondering about it. But I didn't open it. I just set it aside. And then at some point I get a call from Alan Weiss. He tracked me down. He lives in Chicago. I'd met him before, but we really hadn't hadn't seen him in a couple of years. He's like, Hillary, I think I've got all your Splash Brannigan art. <laughs> and I said, what? You know, and I and so I went and opened up my box and said, I said, you know, Alan, I have all your young time strong parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. We got, so we got together and switched them. And when I told Scott about it, he almost hit the ceiling. You know, he wanted to, he wanted to find out who sent the wrong art. The sure. Wrong art. Thank God yeah. it was on the same. It was on the same city, so it was an easy uh, switch yeah. around. So yeah. that's great. You know, I wanted to ask because. Um, you, I'm glad you mentioned Alan Weiss, and you know, there's a guy that I got to uh, get you to, you know, we got to make the connection so Alan can come. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I mean, he's I love. He's got stories for you. He's got. Stories. Oh, I, I have no doubt. But also, I love that. And I was just talking about this. You know, Mike Perkins is, uh, he's uh, going to move back to England and get back with uh, his uh, old community that has a lot of artists. John McRae came from the same area that he's moving back to and, and the like. And I was telling him how great it was being here in Chicago and the amount of uh, local artists that we have. And, you know, uh, contemporaries uh, like, you know, Jill Thompson comes to mind and Tony Akins obviously was here, now is no longer here and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think it's great that, you know, you, you still kind of, well, pre-COVID would, you know, still grab lunch with, you know, Alex Ross and, a lot of these other, uh, you know, creators and stuff, and then everybody get together and hang out. Yeah, I mean, we back in the '80s we were doing it, um, and we had this. We didn't. We didn't have a word. We didn't have a title for it, like drink and draw. But we basically did the same thing. Comics came out, I think, on Thursdays then, and uh, we'd go to Haley's Comics, no longer there. Our friend ran this place, and then there was a there was a bar kitty corner from there that we'd go to. And uh, the torchlight, and we'd we'd have our drink and draws, and I spent way too many Thursday nights there. You know, but we we would do we would do exquisite corpse, you know, drawings. If you know those are that game, we also did comic strip wars where we would just kill each other and pass the pages back and forth. And <laughs> one guy would shoot one guy, and the other guy would come back from the dead, and as a zombie, he'd eat the other guy, and on and on and on. <laughs> very much, high school, very much high school kind of thing. Jill, Jill was really the only woman working in uh, in comics in Chicago at that time. But uh, it was fun, and then that group kind of fell apart. People got married, you know, moved. Sure. And, and then in more recent years, I got together with a much younger group of people. And so Tim Seeley, Mike Norton, Jim Terry, a bunch of uh, a new generation of comic artists, equally talented. And I'm the old fart hanging out with them, you know. Uh, but it's been great, and now and now once again, Alex Ross has gotten the old group together. So occasionally, you know, Alex and me and Alan Weiss and, and Jim Engel and a bunch of our friends will we'll get together and have our art lunches. And that's we excellent. Don't do, we don't do the drinking thing anymore. We're too old for that. So now it's like lunches. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, it's good. No, no, that's terrific, well, man. It's great to see the guys. It's great to see the guys. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And it's funny. I, I. Um... Again, I'm hoping now that things are freeing up. Uh, I'm due to talk to Mike Gold in the next couple of weeks, and when Mike comes to town, we mentioned First Comics earlier, and uh, you know, you spent you obviously you spent time there doing you know Star Slayer and the Badger, and you know, um, even a little American Flag. You know, uh, pretty cool. Not really the Badger. I think it might. Oh, if I did. If I did anything with the Badger, I would have helped somebody out or did a backup. But I did. I didn't do the Badger proper. That would be Bill Reinhold and others. Yeah. Okay. But Munden's but, Bar, you did, you know, I know well, you did some. Was, well, yeah. So so just chronologically going back in time here, yeah. I left for whatever reason. The company was starting here. I was very excited. They were talking about being creator-owned and all this stuff. And it just seemed cool to be working here 
instead of in the you know for a company in New York. So uh, I came to First Comics, and they wanted to break me in as a penciler of a of a regular series, which turned out not to work out. I mean, it just it just <laughs> didn't it you know I, I I was first inking Tim Truman on Star Slayer, and then I was working from his rough pencils or layouts, and eventually stick figures. And they just, you know, they wanted to make this as palatable transition from Tim to me to not lose any of Tim's readers or fans. And I don't think it really worked, but it was it was a great lesson for me because I realized that's not what I do. I don't do action adventure as much as I tried. And I, I met Mark Nelson because once I took over his penciler, I could no longer do both pencils and inks. I couldn't make the deadlines. And so we had to find an inker and I, I ended up finding Mark. and. Um, I had some interesting guys do tryout pages. Gary Gianni even did a sample page, uh, which was interesting. But um, anyway, so, but I also then did other work there, including anything like American Flag you mentioned. Um, but I started writing. It was the first writing I ever did in pro comics was for Munden's Bar. Um, and it was, a, I loved Munden's Bar. It, it was a backup in Grimjack, this, this, science fiction, fantasy, whatever, anything can happen kind of strip. And they welcomed humor and weird and the weirder, the better, I think. Yeah. And, and, and like the, the strips that we saw in the color strips with the little guys, you know, playing video games, though, that sort of Muppet alien was, was the kind of character. Yeah. I was drawing strips like this for Munden's bar. I don't have, I didn't send you any files of Munden's bar, but I, I really love working on that stuff. Cause you just, you had, you know, I guess eight pages and you got to figure out your story, get in, make your, you know, make your point, get out. I, I loved it. Yeah. And I, and they really bought just about every idea I had. It was, it was wonderful. That's great, man. And uh, man, a big slice of your career as well, working at Bongo. And uh, here's a great uh, Trio Savora cover that you did. Yeah. Once, what, at some point I started doing some stories for, for uh, the Simpsons books at Bongo. And I did, I think, I think I did a radioactive man story or two first, and then I got um, the very first uh, Treehouse of Horror story I did. This was just a cover, uh, which was a lot of fun. I think I got a Jason Ho, their 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 art director, gave me probably gave me a layout. My idea though, because Bart was supposedly standing in front of the tree, just looking kind of evil and uh, rubbing his fingers together, and I said, "What if he's holding plant food, but it, instead of Miracle Grow, it's 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 Evil Grow," you know? Is it is it Miracle Grow? Is that what it's called? I forget yeah. what the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, they, they and they love that idea. So um <laughs> yeah. And even the even the treehouse has got teeth on it, you know. It's it's so. such a shame that they closed down Bongo because really uh you know, I keep saying that modern um adaptations of other IP in comics, this is really the golden age of that where we're really getting uh, creators that love the original, whatever it is, cartoon, film, TV, whatever, and they're putting it in the comics, and they read great. And really, Bongo, for years, very funny scripts, great art, unbelievable stuff, uh, and, and really great creators like yourself and Andrew Peepoy and Chuck Dixon wrote amazing Simpsons comics among the other great writers yeah. and stuff. Sure, but even even like a, one of their house writers, you almost would call him because he wrote so many stories. Ian Boothby is a great writer. Yes, and, uh, you know, really, he's a he's a comic he himself. He's a, he's a funny guy, and and, and and he's a funny writer. Uh, no, they they had a wealth of talent there, and you know that once they loosened up the style, the house style, because when it started, they really wanted a dead weight line. Alan, uh, excuse me, you mentioned Andrew Peepoy. He really was the guy that did that by inking. The comics and wanting to make it more, the inking more expressive, vary the line weight. He he opened the door for a lot of us. But the the only place I originally fit in there was doing the Radioactive Man comic, which was basically a comic within the Simpsons universe. So it could be drawn like a comic, and in the Treehouse book, where it's similar to the the television show, the the Halloween stories, you could go co totally crazy. So the, you know. Uh, and I, so I, I must have done three or four of the Treehouse books, and I always called it the, the greatest gig in comics because where else could you write and draw characters where you knew what they sounded like? You know, you actually had a voice in your head. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And you've and also. With, that's where I, I work with uh, Jerry Duggan and uh, uh, 
um, oh, who was his uh, partner then? Um, um, Brian Posehn. Oh, oh, they, they yeah. He wrote a Jaws parody that I drew. That's terrific. Yeah, that's great, man. Then they go on and do Deadpool and have a great run. And God, Jerry's thriving in Marvel. He's doing I, so I, great. I didn't even see it happening. I, I turned around, and Jerry was this guy. I thought, oh, he was just writing. He was writing backups for Fear Agent. He's writing the oddball story for sure for for Bongo. And then all of a sudden, he's like this big time guy. You know? Yeah, yeah. Congratulations to Jerry. Absolutely, man. Well, uh, congratulations to you and and this great stuff that. Uh, please go to uh, Hillary's gallery page and you can see some great Screwy Tuesday stuff and some other original pages. And uh, yeah, Hill, it was great. Find me on social media. I'm all over the place. Yeah, please please let them know, uh, Hill. It's at Hillary I, Bart. I won't, plug, I won't plug the other stuff I'm doing because I don't want to compete with Comic Art Live. But um, yeah, you know, or, or Comic Art fans. But I do I do have other stuff, other places where I have my art and I, and I do other stuff online. But John, it's been a pleasure. Well, As thank always. you, buddy. And, and uh, no, I appreciate that. And no, follow Hillary on, on Twitter at Hillary Barta, uh, also on Instagram and, uh, and of course, on Facebook as well. And uh, uh, every Tuesday, at the very least, you're going to see a brand new uh, image for Screwy Tuesday. So, as always, you dude, thank you for thank hanging you. out. Uh, we'll at see you in the, in the flesh one of these days now that we're both vaccinated, right? No question. Absolutely, we will. And uh, everybody hang tight. We're going to do an hour with Tony Parker in just a couple minutes. So uh, make sure you uh, check that out. But until then, uh, thank you, Hill. And uh, thank you all for watching. And there it is, our, our closeout. But thanks, everybody.